one of the sponsors has been with us from the beginning is our friends out in North Carolina, Highland Canine at Tactical Police Canine, letter K number nine, training.com. They are full service from top to bottom, left to right, north, south, east to west. They have everything, pointy ears, sloppy ears, whatever you want. And they are a full service kennel doing seminars as well as handler schools for complete, completed dogs and as well as green dogs. So be sure to hit them up, Highland Canine at tacticalpolicecaninetraining.com. The Pergasons are fantastic people. Uh, Jason's been on the podcast as well, so go hook, look up his episode. Our uh, One of my favorite sponsors is Dogtra. Uh, the folks over at dogtra.com, they've been doing this for a long time, guys. Um, their e-collars, bark collars, everything they do, we love it. We have a great relationship with them. Uh, they give a discount code WDR10 for 10% off any single item over $200. I tell everybody I have a kennel full of Dogtra e-collars. Most importantly, I have a kennel full of Dogtra bark collars. The YS600 to me is the best piece of equipment in all of dogs. Check them out. Dogtra.com. Check them out on Instagram at Dogtra Official. We really like the guys at Ray Allen Manufacturing. They've been around for freaking ever. They were making working dog equipment before there were working dogs for uh, working bison, apparently. So, uh, and our, their product designer is one of our favorite people, Matt, Matt Wilson. We love Matt. So uh, rayallen.com and everyone thinks, you know, it's only for police and military dogs. And that's not the case. If you have a working dog, whether it's police and military or search and rescue or even hunting, and even if you got pets, they have literally everything minus the dog and the patrol car that you would need to outfit a working team or a pet team for anything, whether it be scent work, whether it be our AKC or UKC scent work, all the way up to explosive and narcotics detection for military and police teams and everything in between. So be sure to hit them up at rayallen.com. Use the discount code working dog radio spelled out for 10% off your order. Probably. Oh, absolutely. Not even probably our first sponsor and longest sponsor is Arno over at ALM. Probably, to me anyways, one of the best guys in all of canine. Um, his website, almcanineequipment.com. Um, you can get on there, give him a call, email him. He's the only guy you're going to talk to, uh, almcanineequipment.com. He has easily the best tugs in the business. His bite suits are amazing. They last for a long time. Ted will tell you he's got the same jacket yep. since... Uh, Noah through the arc out there and uh, his hidden sleeve, I still say is the best in the business. Check him out. Use a discount code W D radio all spelled out 10% off your first order. Check him out on Instagram, ALM canine equipment. All right. We are back working dog radio broadcasting the bite. Uh, I am Ted Summers from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, with me as always from Canton, Ohio is Eric Stambro and, uh, Eric, what's up? Uh, nothing. This is for those of you who don't know, this is my wife, Lori. She's uh, <laughs> sitting in, you'll understand here in a few minutes. Why, um, just usual stuff, man. Uh, working dogs. I got a class starts Monday. Um, a handler class. I got a couple dogs in it. Uh, just sold a couple green dogs on Friday and delivering a couple more this week, Friday, I think. Um, Finally thawed out here in Ohio. It's been the tundra. Like for us, it's even odd how cold it's been and how snow, much snow for a month. Usually here it's yeah, three, four days and it cools and it warms up a little bit and then you get a little bit more, but it's been real bad. But you know, when you're dog owners, when the freeze thaws, you know what that means? Poop. Right. Picking poop. up poop in the yard in the back. It took me forever today to do that. So um, what's going on with you? Uh, worky, worky. We thought out finally too. We've been tracking. I've been tracking pepper and working, uh, odor with these labs. I've got, uh, these single purpose labs. So I'm working. Who's pepper on. remind everybody pepper. She's pepper. The Dutchie, um, is the dog for uh CBS seal team, uh, the new dog. Um, so she's, uh, yeah, she's going to be fun to do. I think, uh, Melnick is going to be uh presently surprised when he gets her back assuming he doesn't fall out any more helicopters did you see that he fell out of a helicopter the other day yeah, yeah. No he's thanks. fine everybody he's fine he fell out of a helicopter he didn't die it only felt like 15 feet or something so <laughs> it's no big a deal lot of people died from 15 foot falls though that's a true story 
<laughs> he's fine. I told you, at least you talked to him the other day. And we we're like, dude, were you going to tell us you fell out of a helicopter? And he was like, I'm fine. I'll be all right. I'm sore. I'm like, no, oh, okay. So uh, this is clearly um, not a normal episode. <laughs> so uh, what are we doing tonight? Yeah. So we got uh, our guest people reached out to our people. It's fun to say because we never get to say that. Because everybody just texts us directly or messages on on Instagram or whatever, and um, we jumped at the chance to have have him on. So um, our guest today is, and a lot of you will, especially you female viewers, we'll get into that here in a minute. We'll recognize our uh, our guest, Lieutenant Joe Kenda, twenty three year veteran of the Colorado Springs Police Department, spent twenty one years chasing killers as a homicide detective and commander of the Major Crimes Unit. Ken and his team solved 356 of his 387 homicide cases, which is a 92% uh, solve rate, which is insanely high. It's, in fact, one of the highest in the country. After retiring from law enforcement, he starred in Homicide Hunter, Lieutenant Joe, Lieutenant Joe Kenda, an American true crime documentary series that ran for nine seasons on the Investigation Discovery Network. And my wife saw every single episode probably <laughs> twice, at least, maybe three times. Um, it was aired in 69 countries and territories worldwide. At its peak, Homicide Hunter averaged 1.9 million viewers in the U.S. Uh, you can see Lieutenant uh, Kend on his new crime series, American Detective. I spent my career closing murder cases. But I'm not the only one who answered the call. It takes a rare breed to solve the unsolvable. To catch a ruthless killer, to find justice for the dead. That's what it takes to be an American detective. Plus, he's an author. So without further ado, we welcome Lieutenant Joe Kenda. How are you, sir? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. It's It's been amazing to have you. We're excited. This is like uh, definitely a different uh, format for us. Um, was Alicia over there stretching? She's out of the camera. She's yeah, she's standing doing right lunges, there. getting ready. She's fucking looking at me. Yeah, <laughs> she when they when uh, the the PR people reached out to us, and I was like, "Why do I?" I kind of read the text message uh, from our handler guy, and I was like, "Why do I know this name?" And Alicia's like, "Oh my god, how do you not know?" And I'm like, "Oh, okay." It took me a second. <laughs> well, yeah, no, uh, you know, it was, um, it, it's, it was uh, a night, a welcome surprise. The last episodes we've done have been pretty heavy on um, like some very, very technical like canine stuff. So this is a very nice um, like change up and I'm super stoked. Um, so uh, we, we got a copy of the new book, the killer, uh, killer triggers. And um, we read through it. There you talk a lot about dogs in there, ironically. So kind of the first, um conversations internally with us and our group we're like okay well how are we gonna you know can tie this into canine and you told some fantastic dog stories in there so (laughs) eric why don't you (laughs) go that go down that rabbit hole so uh before you got into you know i was a cop for a total of 27 years i worked 23 years at the the department i retired from when i got on the department canines man i loved it i I watched those guys i was watching what they're doing i'm like yeah i want to do that um eventually got to do it for 13 years before i retired uh training handling and all that stuff when your department colorado first of all before i get into something you're from outside of pittsburgh i am i was uh, born and raised in a coal mining town 30 miles east of pittsburgh called harmony pennsylvania so 30 miles isn't that far to lose that yinzer accent do you uh everyone how'd you do that every once in a while you go downtown or anything i do not I uh, <laughs> uh, over it took some time because I was yeah. born in the area and that's what they they speak Pittsburghese as they said. Oh yeah, yeah. But, that's uh, that area's big mafia area over out where you're at. Did it get to the right. mafia out where you're at? Uh, not really. There's some in Pueblo, Colorado. There were the mafia is a shadow of its former self. I mean, back in the day they were important, but now they're nothing. They don't even run the prisons anymore. Yeah, but he's still uh, still got a lot in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. Anyways, let's fast forward to you get on the job. And you guys got a lot of dogs in Colorado Springs. We do. We uh, always use canines. I had to use them a lot in investigations and a number of different murder cases that uh, some are mentioned in the book. Others are not. 
an, an example, if you if we have a moment, I can tell you about mm-hmm. one. Oh, yeah. a, a woman calls the police, says her common law husband just came home and he seems to be dead in the front porch. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> the arrives, this guy who is literally in viscera, see his major organs in his chest. Somebody cut him eye wide and continuously. It's not her. She doesn't have a drop of blood on her. What happened here? He plays cards in the neighborhood for money. He walks to these places. And when he's done playing, he comes home. I heard something scratching at the door. I answered the door and it was him on the ground saying, they've killed And those were his last words. Where did he go tonight? I don't know. So we have the end of a crime scene, but not the beginning. Get me a dog. Can an officer shows up? I want a point of origin on our man here. And that dog took us and marched us down the street four blocks, turned right, went two blocks, turned right again, went two more blocks, went up the porch of a house and sat down. This would be it. <laughs> and we knocked her and uh, one thing led to another and we have our arrest. So dogs can be an immensely useful tool in investigations. That's an unusual sort of search, you know, an unusual situation where you're using a dog to find where a stabbing happened. You know where it ended, but you don't know where it began. That's an interesting thing. Like we don't ever track backwards. And uh, teach them to find the freshest odor. So, I mean, I would imagine... (laughs) that it wouldn't be that big of a deal but i've never heard of a dog where we derek have you guys any of your guys ever done that uh just look at we've done backward tracking looking for stuff like uh, evidence oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah through that type right. of stuff i mean that's more kind of just a let them kind of go out you know at the end of the leash and, and kind of work that um what so when you were running major crimes what what crimes did that consist of uh, i had a homicide unit um Serious bodily assault against children and adults, sex crimes against children and adults, gangs, and fugitives. All the fun stuff. Oh, yeah. So you you probably got to use the dogs in a lot of different spots there. Oh, we did. We uh, used dogs for constantly, particularly high-risk arrest, warrant service, high-risk warrant service. It's interesting to me. Humans are interesting to me. I don't understand humans, but they interest me. Since the days of early man on the Serengeti plant, people have two natural fears, deep in their subconscious and their DNA. They're afraid of fire and they're afraid of animals. Both will result in a horrible death. People react that way to a police canine. You have a crowd of 300 people in the street raising hell, bring out one dog. He goes up on his hind legs, he's six feet tall, he sounds like the hound of the Baskervilles, and he wants to eat everybody in this crowd. And those people in that crowd all say the same thing to themselves. There's 400 people here, but if that officer lets that dog go, he's going to eat me, not the other 399. It's going to be. So I think I'm going to go home now. <laughs> and first a crowd in two minutes, one officer, one dog, three, 400 people, you're down to six or eight people in two minutes. Remarkable device. So when we use those dogs, uh, I would call K-9 and say, we're gonna arrest this guy for murder. We're gonna arrest this guy for 40 counts of first degree sexual assault. We're gonna arrest somebody that we think is dangerous, somebody that probably has a gun and may know we may be coming looking for him. And I want a dog or two to come with us. Absolutely. And we'd always work together with them. And if we bar- if the guy barricaded, we would uh, make the dog announcement. You have a minute to leave the premise, hands where we can see them. Our police canine will be released into the interior of where you are and injury to you is likely to result. <laughs> and the dog knows about that dog warning. Oh yeah, you know, they do. Bruce, so the dog knows it's my turn. I get to kill somebody. This is going to be great. So they go crazy. The guy on the other side of that door hears that. 
here's that dog. And you normally hear him say in a muffled voice, I'm coming out. Good choice. Please come out. The dog never gets released. Nobody gets hurt. More yeah. of a threat than an actual attack. Absolutely. You know, those are the ones that a lot of times we don't hear a lot about. I mean, our guys have had several uh, surrenders and have stopped suicide by cops and all kinds of stuff because you know, people think that they can rationalize with a human being for some reason, right? Like, you know, or they think that they can talk their way out of getting arrested or getting something, but I've, almost universally, no one thinks that they can rationalize with a dog. <laughs> no one wants to. No, <laughs> nobody wants to. So that's it. Uh, super interesting. One of the other things, like Eric just mentioned, you know, we, um, we do a lot of uh, recovery. So I jokingly say that, you know, um, dogs only job is to find stuff and bite people. Right. So that's their job. They find drugs or bombs or evidence, and then they bite fools if need be. So um, one of our local dogs here has recovered several murder weapons. Uh, actually, a couple of our teams have. Um, do you guys have any instances of that where you had assistance from a dog where a suspect was like, well, I threw the gun here but I don't remember or whatever, a gun, knife, whatever it is, but able to find evidence that would have not been able to be found any otherwise? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll tell you about a case we had where very unusual murder came in 1990. A woman gets, starts having an affair with a married guy. She's married to, but not to each other. They decide, they literally decide that if they kill this guy's wife, life is going to be good. And they'll get the insurance money and start over. So they arrange for, they plan this thing for months. And they pose or act as if it's a street robbery. And they shoot and kill this woman. And they run off into the night. One person, not two, one shooter. We get a dog, picks up a scent. It's cold. There's no wind. It's a perfect scent night, according to the handler. We get the area where the dog, we saw, knew the guy ran a certain way. We saw footprints in the grass. The dog tracked that scent for a mile in a neighborhood. Got to a trash can and alerted. In the can is a ski mask and a jacket worn by the perpetrator. Then follows the track to a curb line and loses the track. So the shooter's got a car. The shooter runs almost a little over a mile from the crime scene, deposits some evidence in a trash can, closes the lid, gets in a car and leaves the area. Wouldn't have been for that dog, would have never found that jacket or the ski mask, which turned out to be critical in actually unraveling the case. It would take all evening to explain the whole thing to you, but the dog was a critical piece of that Initial investigation. Where did this person go? This way. Did they leave anything? Yeah, they did. Let's go find that. So it's hard to explain, really, how valuable they are until you experience it. Yeah, we we do a lot of training. You know, I handled four dogs and did a lot of tracking and things like that. We. Uh, we always assume when we lose sight of the dog or the dog loses the track, that's probably got picked up by somebody. Um, mm -hmm. So we actually do it to a training scenario where we teach the handler to know exactly what that looks like when he gets to the end. And there's, I mean, out of odor, uh, nothing happened. And so it's definitely, it's a pretty good assumption nowadays. I think with the amount of, you know, with phones and people can call for pickups and help and things like that, but it's definitely, um, People still do crap in their own neighborhood, which is amazing to me. But um, they do. so yeah. it's not all about work, though. So we were reading in the book about a dog that uh, you had. You, you seem to have a, a kind of a, I don't know, a special kindred spirit with some of these dogs. That, <laughs> right. That particular, dog, <laughs> that particular dog was and you talk about an alpha dog. That was Axe. The other dogs were afraid of him. Hmm. His own. A little bit afraid of him and all the other handlers wouldn't go near him but ax and i got along great similar personalities psychotic i presume but ax and i were buddies and if they'd bring that dog into the police operations center that's home turf for them so they'd take him off a lead 
I would whisper his name and he'd come charging from my office and sit down next to me. Hmm. And his hand would come in and say, how do you do that? I said, I don't know. He likes me. Hey, yeah. anyways, you're not supposed to like you. You're the boss. I'm just a friend of his. And I wanted that dog really badly uh, when they were going to retire him, but they were working too long and too hard. And they had to put him down. And that was a real shame. But actually, yeah. I got they work, man. They work them. Uh, a lot of them work until, and that's what they want to do. And they work until time's up, you know, yeah. pretty much. And um, that's what they work them to do. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. Yep. Um, I have one more question. Then Ted's got something for you. Uh, you had one live in your house for a while. What What so is it like when a dog goes from all that work to retirement and then to your house? Oh, of course. Uh, a friend of mine on the police department was going to build a new house. They sold their house. They had to move in an apartment. Well, he had retired, or not retired from the department, but he left canine and took this dog with him when he left canine as a vet. Well, no apartment complex in the city would take that dog. 110-pound German Shepherd, whether he's police trained or not, they didn't have anything to do with it. So he brought Harry to my house. Harry von Stroheim was his name. Harry was a piece of work. Very successful dog. And uh, I said, well, we'll see if he gets along with, with our dog. I had a chow at the time. Guard dog for the kids. And the wife, a lot of people want to kill me. And uh, we had this dog. They kind of had a truce. The chow went to one side of the downstairs and the shepherd went to the other side. They just kind of stayed apart. And we had Harry for six months. But my wife told these guys, there were some carpet people that came to the place. Do not open the door. Hmm. We've got these dogs and they went through this whole explanation. Well, of course, that lasted 30 minutes. They opened the door. They were hot, you know, they want to get a breeze going. They both took off. So my wife goes looking for him. Now the chow stayed right in the cul-de-sac where we live, figuring I'd be in trouble here if I go anywhere. So she was there in the yard. Harry is gone. I'm at work. Kathy goes down the street and sees a cruiser, flags him down. Yes, ma'am. She said, do you know who I am? No, I'm Lieutenant Kendis White. Oh, hi. I've, I've lost a canine. You what? God. <laughs> and I lost his name's Harry. Oh, I know Harry. Well, just let him out. Oh, boy. Or it, well, I don't know where he is. You go that way, we'll go this way. She, well, he's, the officer told her, if he sees a cruiser, he'll load up. He'll get in a police car. So I'll go look for him. You go look for him. She goes down to the city park, two blocks away. He's playing football with little kids. <laughs> yeah. I'm having, he's having a hell of a good time. Parents are there and says, is that your dog? He's such a nice dog. And she's thinking, oh, my God. You know. But he was fine. He was just happy. And when he saw her, she called him by name, and his ears dropped. They figured, oh, I'm going to jam now because I'm not in a car. But uh, she took him back home. No harm done. But that cop about had a heart attack. What do you mean you lost it? Well, <laughs> I can... Uh, yeah, I can only imagine you know, losing a dual purpose dog. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, that was that too. Like, where, where you uh, so, being in major crimes, um, you obviously deal with murders. Um, what have you ever had any uh, cases where you had to use human remains dogs to either find where a body was at or where one had been or use it to recover human remains? Like, way yeah. after the fact uh we often did have to use a cadaver dogs uh to look for remains we had a confession we had a guy long story short he uh, reports his business partner is missing of course he was a major part of why he was missing but he reported him as a missing person for three months we screw with this guy because we don't believe him we know he killed him. We don't know where he killed him or how he did it, but we know he's got to be involved in this. And he finally breaks and says, okay, you know, I, I didn't bury him. 
Well, that's helpful. <laughs> so he takes us off in the, in the mountains and points out the spot. There's nothing there. No clothing, no shoes, no blood, no nothing. Hmm. And we said, hey, no, this isn't working. And he said, I'm telling you, man, I'm, that's where it is. Well, it's not there, chief. So we got to start looking elsewhere. The next day, a guy who lives up in the woods in a cabin lets the dog out, a golden retriever, for his morning constitutional. The dog comes back with the guy's head and drops it on the porch. So I thought, isn't this cool? Huh? Oh, God. We, we take the, the head to the morgue, and we get a guy from wildlife. from Colorado has a division of wild game, you know. And uh, he comes to the morgue and he looks at this head and he said, it's a bear, took that off. So I guess he figured he didn't need that part. Oh. They never did find the rest of it, but we did find his head. Good. We bugs in there and they hid on the spot. We knew the guy wasn't lying, but where'd it go? The dogs tracked uphill for a mile or two and then stopped, lost the scent and that was kind of the end of it. So. We assumed it was wildlife intervention, but you thought, what the hell could pick up a dead guy? Well, it turns out a bear can, apparently. Yeah, man. Oof. All right. So having <laughs> this is going to uh, this question here, your answer is, is because you're uh, an outside of the canine, meaning you didn't handle a dog. You didn't work a dog. You didn't train the no. dogs. So you should be unbiased. I have a feeling what your answer is going to be, but it's an, it's solve the the age-old question now, what is better, German Shepherd or Malinois? I've seen them both work. I like the Shepherd better than a Malinois. Just a personal opinion, not that I know anything about it. I'm certainly no dog guy. I just like dogs, but I'm not, I, I don't understand them. I don't train them, I don't work them. I never trusted the Malinois, they just, didn't look right to me. <laughs> Don't trust them. No, like, <laughs> no, 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 you shouldn't trust them. <laughs> the shepherd, I, I, I could relate to a shepherd. I couldn't ever feel like I could relate to a man of one. Yeah, I, I get that. There's a lot of people who feel like that too. Um, all right, listen, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Uh, when we come back, you're going to be looking at some different hosts. The, uh, the ladies of Working Dog Radio are going to take over because, um, Lieutenant Joe Kenda's milkshake brings all the girls to the yard. Everybody I know who's a fan of that show is a woman. They love it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, um, it's time for the ladies. Yeah, don't right. fast forward through the commercials either. <laughs> all right. So sorry to interrupt the great conversation we are having, but we have amazing sponsors that we need to bring to you. Um, one of our favorites, one of our oldest is Southern Coast Canine. The folks down there, the Heisers, they are great folks down there in Smyrna, New Smyrna, Florida, right? They got everything you need to do down there, guys. Um, full service kennel, southerncoastk9.com. Give them a call, 877-903-DOGS. The uh, Southern Coast K9 folks have killer dogs, guys. Everyone we've seen have been badass. Check them out on Instagram at Southern Coast K9. Everybody knows that training is super important. One of the best training conferences in the country is HITS. It's by canine handlers, for canine handlers. HITS canine, letter K number nine dot net. The largest vendor show in the country, the largest giveaway for handlers in the country, and some of the most skilled instructors in the country, plus Eric and I. We're going to be there July 6th through the 9th in Scottsdale, Arizona, bringing the HRD Roadshow to everyone there doing the presentation about scenario-based training and then they've got everybody there from the industry to do fantastic presentations also uh classifies and, and sort of uh, for your training hours when you come back to your department so it's going to be in scottsdale arizona july 6th to the 9th be sure to hit up jeff barrett 863-529-5113 uh or hits k9 letter k number nine dot net the other big thing that guys mess around with and don't get right is nutrition for their dogs. Our good friends down at Kinetic Dog Food, they got it right. 
uh, especially if you own a kennel. Uh, like there's all kinds of problems that go along with owning a kennel with a lot of dogs, kennel stress and things. These guys are great. They service some of the largest kennels in the country. Kineticdogfood.com. Their stuff is so good. Give them a call. 513-615-6904. Kinetic Dog Food on Instagram. Wonderful people. Wonderful food. Check them out. Kineticdogfood.com. Next up, we have a sponsor that's moved us for quite a while, Quick Derm by Vet Care. This stuff is magic. For whatever reason, working dogs have this uncanny ability to hurt themselves in fantastic and magical ways. Don't let small problems be big ones. Happy tail, torn up paws. Uh, one of our good buddies and also one of our interviews, uh, Jake Hutchinson, had a, uh, his dog got kicked in the face by a horse. The stitches were healed up very quickly with vet care. I use it on my tattoos. Uh, Alicia just got a new one and she's using it as well. It stuff is magic. So hit him up at vetcare.us. Use the discount code 10WDR for 10% off your first order. Awesome stuff. Our brand new sponsor, guys, and he's a good dude, man. He really is a good dude, good trainer. He's been on the podcast, friend of ours. He's worked with us at HRD, great decoy. Jim O'Brien down at NCK9 in North Carolina, obviously. NC stands for North Carolina. NCK9, letter K number nine. Uh, great stuff, guys. Their police dogs are good. Floppy ear, pointy ear, dual purpose, single purpose. Handler schools, better weather than we have in Ohio. Give them a call, 919 438 0141 check out his website nck9.us uh hit him up on instagram at nck9 llc for them guys training is not a job it is their life all right guys we are back with working dog radio broadcasting the bite uh it's kind of a first for us it's new i'm usually behind the uh mic making mean faces um I am the editor. Most people know my voice. I am the one who brings us into the podcast every day. Um, We are super excited uh, because I've watched you for years. And uh, so we're here with Lieutenant Joe Kenda. um, And uh, me and Lori get to take over um, because this is kind of our jam. I don't want to say I'm a homicide expert, but I've watched a lot of crime shows. So I feel very adept at doing this. Um, I think we'll get right to it. Um, I think my favorite thing about you, Lieutenant, do you want Lieutenant Kenda, Joe? Call me Joe, call me Kenda. Adnack is my name backwards, whatever you prefer. (laughs) So I think one of my favorite things about you, and I call them Kenda-isms, I, I, I searched this. We should do kendaism.com because you need an official site because clearly we're buying ripoff t-shirts that, you yes. know, yeah, we need to get you. Do you have an official merchandise site? Discovery store sells merchandise from Homicide Hunter and that is official Discovery merchandise. Well, it's extremely good quality and it does have the the feature of it being genuine, and it is a much better product than what you can buy on the internet and from here and there. What I have bought on the internet, and I'm going straight to your official site after this to oh. make up for this mistake right here. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> so, well, those, the, at the Discovery Store, they sell they sell merchandise of every type. They sell T-shirts. They sell hats. Uh, they sell coffee cups with my picture on it, my signature on it. Uh, they even have one called Cup of Joe, which I think is very funny. Some awesome. And, but it's all from them and it's all very good, very good quality. Excellent, now we know where to go. Leave it somebody else. Awesome. Well, uh, some of my favorite sayings of yours. Um, oh, you're smart, you're street smart. Sesame Street smart. Mm, true. Give me some context. <laughs> well, there's you talk to people. Everybody knows this is a policeman. I mean, these are these are people. Nobody has a Mensa card in their wallet. Okay, deal with on a routine, but they're not very bright. They tell terrible lies. They tell really disconnected stories in interrogation. It's pathetic, really. I had a guy in an interrogation once, and I said, you know. 
You've been mercifully spared from the ravages of intelligence. And he said, what? Never mind. People don't understand sometimes how stupid they are. And I would have somebody tell me a story about how they couldn't possibly be involved in murdering their wife or their friend or their drug dealer buddy. And I'd say, you know, I, I listen to stories all day here, all day, sometimes all night. I really feel sorry for you. Well, why do you feel sorry for me? Well, because if this isn't the worst story I've ever heard, it's in the top five. Surely you could have done better than this. You have nothing else to think about for the last several days except getting arrested and explaining yourself. And this is it. You're supposed to be street smart, not Sesame Street smart. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Get... And what's your, uh, well, you have to give us your famous my, my, my. <laughs> that all started, they picked that up as a tagline, the network did. They said, use it as a device in an interrogation. I would begin by being very nice, always very nice. In fact, confused. I'd walk into an interrogation room dropping papers on the floor. The first thing I would say was, you know, I don't even understand why you're here. I mean, they said you've been arrested, but I, I, don't, I don't know how, I don't know what happened. Now, street people are not clever, but they're cunning. They see weakness in somebody like that. And they try to exploit it. So they think, well, I can talk my way past this guy. He's a dumb shit. And I'll get out of this. So we go through that process for a few, a little bit. So, you know, I want you to tell me what happened. So maybe I can help you. Maybe I can. That was just on the word, maybe. But I have to advise you, you're right. So you understand that, don't you? Oh, yeah. Tell me what my rights are, because I want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody else, just you, because you're dumb. So I want to talk to you. So they, they wave and have them tell you their story. I don't take notes. I didn't record anything, no video, no nothing. But I remember every word you say, every word. I would wait two hours. Then I would say, well, you know, you told me what happened, but I don't remember what you said. Can you tell me again? Well, of course, he can't tell you again because he made up this entire story out of lies. And what I want to hear is the first lie. Tell me a lie. Because if you'll lie to me, I'm talking to the right guy. Innocent people don't have to lie. So when that would happen, he would say the lie. And I would slam my notebook on the desk and I'd say, well, my, my, my. <laughs> now, two hours ago, you said this. And now you say this. Were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or maybe you're just a liar. What do you think? And he's thinking, what happened to my friend? Your friend left. Now Detective Antichrist is here. <laughs> and I would say to them at that moment, now we're going to play a very sophisticated game of tag. And you are it. Let me see if I can touch you. Then I would start a different game. Well, when they heard me say the my, 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 they thought that was, I don't know what they thought, but they thought that was what they wanted to use. So that became the tagline of the show. That's amazing. And listen, I haven't committed a crime that you know of, uh, but I would fold like a lawn chair just <laughs> immediately. So, you know, so Lori, what about you? I know you've got some questions. Yes. Yeah, so um, Homicide Hunter was on for nine seasons um, and I did watch every episode multiple times. Um, yep. Why Why did you choose not to continue after the nine seasons? Why did you end it? 
I had filmed about half of season nine. And I called the people I have at Discovery and I said, hey, I'm gonna end this series after the end of season nine. What? Because <laughs> I'm cutting down the money tree, you know. I said, I'm out of bullets, boys and girls. What I have remaining are they too simple. We came, we saw, we arrested. Are too disgusting. Children and babies, and I won't do them. So I'm done. Been fun. And by the way, thanks for the money. <laughs> but it's over. And I hung up. 30 minutes go by, phone rings. It's the number three guy in Discovery. Kathy answered, my wife answered the phone. Is Joe there? <laughs> yeah, he's here. I took the phone, I said, hi. I said, Joe, we're like the Corleones. The only way out of this for you is death. <laughs> we're gonna go serious. Well, okay, all right. And that's American Detective on Discovery Plus right now. So that's the new show. Yes, I uh, I've watched a couple episodes of that. That's I like that too. Uh, your role Good. in that is more the the host, so Correct. we don't get to see as much of our Joe Kenda as we like. But you're telling no. other detective stories, correct? Right, that's correct. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah. All the other the other detectives. All the 144 episodes were cases that I was personally involved in. So it was a different perspective in terms of how the case was presented because I did it. In the new show, other people have done it. And I comment on their efforts and say a few things about the bad guys and so on. So not quite the same, but it still involves me. Um, so when you were doing the homicide hunter, was it scripted at all or was it, nope. I just imagine you're just talking off the cuff, just telling your stories. And... I'll tell you a funny story and it's a true story. We did the first season of MGM in Hollywood and I'm sitting in this and I have no idea what's going on. I'm a, I'm a new guy. Okay. I'm a, I'm a rookie. There's people everywhere. There's lights everywhere. There's cameras everywhere. There's microphones. It's, a hundred people. It was insane. And I'm looking all around, fascinated by all this. This guy drops 50 pounds of paper in my lap. And he said, I said, what's that? That's your script. I said, hey, I'm not an actor. I'm a policeman. I got over playing dress up when I was five. You should have too. <laughs> oh, that pissed him off. I meant to. <laughs> I said, look, you turn that camera on. I'll tell you about this murder for 15 minutes. You don't like what I say? We'll talk about the script. All right. He's prepared not to like what I say. Let's talk to the camera for 15 minutes. I stood up and said, is that what you had in mind? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, we don't, uh, we don't need that script. Okay. Had been one sense. <laughs> they cut out the profanity, which I don't know why they do that. Profanity is the language of the street, but they don't put it on. But other than that, I say whatever I want. So all of your cases on the show for all those years, all those episodes, um, you re you remembered all of those cases. I read where you yes. barely looked at the files, um, and that's amazing to me it's like um is it that you remember it or it's things that you just can't forget about ever that it it's has an impact on you like that i have a photographic memory which is both a blessing and a curse right. most curse is remember everything including the bad things but the other thing that i it's very intense to me it was not a job it was a mission you don't get to kill one of my taxpayers. You don't get to do this against the law. But I'm going to focus on you until I find you. So it became everything to me. I remember every one of those cases like they have in the morning. 
every noise, every smell, every everything. I would only look at the file to make sure I had the middle name correct on this. And that couple things, and that's all I'd do. And the rest of it would be turn that camera on. Let's go. I tell you about this. And it's um, recounting my experiences, which was very therapeutic for me. It made me feel immensely better than I'd ever felt. I said more to the camera than I ever said to my wife about those cases because they wanted to hear everything. So I thought, all right, let's you hear everything. And they turned that camera on and the floodgates open. And I upset them on a number of occasions where they walked out of the room and they, you know, this sort of thing. And they put didn't put some of that on television. But you said you wanted to know. So I'm gonna tell you. That's deep stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to lighten it up a little. So can you tell me just how many times you have been kicked in the shins? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was one other time uh, that I, a lady, a uh, little old lady, kicked me in the shin, drew blood. <laughs> and I was looking at her friend who had killed himself, and I'd arrested him the day before. He bonded out, came home and killed himself. He had murdered five people by preparing a furnace incorrectly and killing them with carbon monoxide. I arrested him for five counts of manslaughter. Posted bond, got up, came home, gassed himself in a car. 5.30 in the morning, she's standing there. His buddy, she said, you pulled the trigger on him yourself and kicked me in the shin. I mean... Really hard, almost down. Two uniform cops driver and arrest her. And she's crying. And you know, I said, let her go. Let her go. Well, she assaulted. Yeah, I know. Let her go. I put her face in my hands and I said, hey, go home. And remember your friend as he was and not how he is now. And I had stopped smoking then for three years. And I went to a 7-Eleven store nearby and I went in and bought a box of Band-Aids and doctored my leg and sat down on the curb and did, took care of that. And then I went back in that store and bought a pack of cigarettes and came back out and smoked every one of them. And I was right back in the game. That was one time I had a leg. And of course, the girl and her Mary Janes, her patent leather Mary Janes, she did that at two. I guess I deserved it. So um, we got the fortune uh, to get to have an early sneak peek at your new book, Killer Triggers. And uh, I've already read it all. Lori's already read it all. Uh, it's awesome. Um, I think I we, uh, for me, chapter three really struck a chord um, uh, when you're talking about killer triggers. You said you examine the trigger that leads to death. And yes. this one happened to be dementia. And I think the, okay. yeah, the, the uh, title of the chapter is The Undoing of a Good Man. And it really struck a chord with me, like uh, especially with COVID and lockdown and unemployment and the riots and the political you know, nightmare that's going on right now. So mm -hmm. many people um, than ever before are struggling with mental health and um, just excessive stress compounding and compounding. So I really read that chapter and it resonated, I think, with kind of the current situation in the world. What, tell me a little bit about that for you. And then, um, you know, what we can do to, uh, to recognize that in our loved ones, in ourselves, in, in the people that we care about and work about. Certainly. It's a horrible situation. You have someone who's led a solid life, as he certainly had, who all of a sudden suffers a series of small strokes that alters, in his case, his personality. 
and also comes on for a number of different causes in dementia as you age. The worst thing about it is it changes you completely. And it can make you into a violent person. It can. It doesn't, it doesn't have to, but it often does. I think the best advice for families, if someone's personality changes dramatically, someone's suddenly very quiet, they're maybe a little distant, they seem tired a lot, they say they want to go to bed early, they make comments about how I don't want to get up tomorrow, uh, something I'm here, and it isn't good. When that personality change begins in anyone, not just an older person, but even a teenager, something is happening in their mind that is destructive. They need counseling, not from you, but from a professional. You need to take them somewhere. A pretext of taking them somewhere, if nothing else works, and get them into some sort of situation where they can be counseled. No one can deal with a mental patient like someone who's trained to do so. To expect the police to be able to do it is a non-starter. Police aren't trained for that. Well, I'm going to call the police. What are they going to do? Have very limited choices. So you need to find somebody. Every community has this some sort of system, some sort of anything. Department of Social Services, county mental health, city mental health, whatever. Make arrangements in advance and see this person gets in there to find out what it is that's happening with them that's making them change their personality so dramatically. In this particular case, as in this chapter. Woman and her husband live alone. Very few people have a lot of contact with them, including the one child that have lived in the area, the doctor, who sees them occasionally, but probably not often enough to notice the changes. The mother noticed the changes and spoke to her minister about it, who also was not qualified to speak to the issue of mental health. But of course, he believed he was. So he told this woman that it's just a phase. A phase? No, it's not a phase. It's a potentially very serious problem. And she relaxed, thinking that, well, he'll get over this. No, he won't. No, he won't. In this particular case, he begins to make death lists writing down names of people that should die. Oh, 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 oh. We've gone from subconscious to conscious mind. Now we're making a plan to engage in violence. Good heavens. You have to recognize it when you see it. And it begins with this change. If this person is different, suddenly different, and suddenly dramatically different, and it goes on for more than a few days, you need a professional to get involved, or something awful is gonna happen, as it did in that case. I feel like the questions that I wrote down for you kind of look like a death list, so I should probably tear this up and burn it after we're done with the interview so that no one finds this eventually because it just has little notes on it that says like in quotations i will find you and i'm like um <laughs> that's just his first book it's not what i mean to say right. it's not a threat yeah it's not a threat it's just his first book. <laughs> excellent so i have a question for you about um your magnificent eight you were the maestro of the magnificent eight I so was. um I'm curious as to, you're very successful, like unheard of how many crimes you solved. Um, the key to your success is the magnificent eight and your team that you had in place. 
was that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We were an orchestra, a very well lubricated orchestra. <laughs> but it had a skill. Everybody played an instrument. Everybody played a role. I didn't do any of this by myself. It's a team. All equal parts. Everybody had an opinion. Everybody was listened to. Would have a meeting every morning or sometimes every four hours. What do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Now we all know what we all know. Now, what do you think we ought to do about that? Where should we go now? I'd be the decider, but I'd listen to everybody. Many things are better than one. In a lot of police departments, they have homicide divisions. You have, in, for example, on the Chicago P, there are nine homicide units throughout the city. City of New York, two per borough, Manhattan North, Manhattan South, Brooklyn North, Brooklyn South, precinct detectives, all sorts of people. In Colorado Springs, there's one homicide unit, me and eight people. That's it. Wow. We get them all. Hence the numbers. Over time, it works out to about 19 a year. It's not that huge number, but times 20 some odd years it is. Mm -hmm. And those people and I resolved all those because we wanted to. For all of us, it was a mission. I used to tell, I used to would interview people to join the you know, homicide, you know, when people would promote out or get burned out or whatever. I would personally interview people. And I would say to them, hey, here's the deal. You're joining the most elite club in the world. We're going to chase the bad guys and we're going to find them. That's what we're here to do. Don't ever tell me you're tired. Don't ever tell me you're hungry. Don't ever tell me you need to go home and see your wife. If I thought you needed a wife, I would issue you one. <laughs> we are here to do this. As long as there's something to do, we're going to be here doing it. And I'm going to be here with you. I'm not asking you to do anything that I won't do. But this is the job. If you don't like that idea, tell me now. We'll part friends. Go ride a motorcycle. Go be a dog handler. Go be a narcotics agent. You don't want to do this if you can't cut that kind of commitment. And guys would say to me, I don't think it's for me. I appreciate your honesty. No hard feelings. Thanks for coming in. But other guys would say, stops. And then you would say, or I would say to them, then welcome aboard. An example. I'm in my office. Guy shows up to work. His first day as a homicide detective. He looks like he's a banker. He's wearing a three-piece suit. He's very impressive looking. And I said, that is a wonderful outfit. I said, well, thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, I said, come in here a minute. Because I was the boss. I had a window in my office. I could actually see outside. I said, you see that smoke rising in the south part of the city? Yeah, that's a house fire. Really? Yep. There's a woman dead in there. Fire department says she's been shot. It's a consumer fire. And it's your case. Sir, it's my first day. I know. You go from being a new guy to an old guy around here in about 15 months. I'm going to come with you. With you. And unless you do something horribly illegal, I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> well, let's go. So we go to this crime scene, and he did a wonderful job. And in two days of nonstop effort, we had the shooter. Awesome. He's exhausted. He has a beard. His suit but as big as it did two days ago, but he has an arrest. And he was absolutely thrilled beyond belief. I said, there you go, my boy. You're now one of the lads. And it was a great experience. A great experience for him, a great experience for me. That's all part of the team. That's what makes it work. So your 28 cases, your mere 28 cases that were not solved, do you think um, with the DNA tech and the technology and everything in today's world that 
you probably could have solved those crimes and then at like 98 percent well it could be there were actually 31 i had oh, 300 okay. 387 31 unsolved today there's 28 because of advances in dna okay. the code has resolved three of my unsolved cases in two of those three, I thought I knew who it was, and I did. We couldn't prove it. The third one, we had no clue. And that person just pled guilty last week or two weeks ago. No oh, wow. 25 years ago. But DNA was just coming into the fray before I retired. And it was pretty basic, and it could only do a few things, and it was expensive, and you needed a pretty big sample before you could do anything. And now, of course, it's gone crazy with what they can do. But then it did not. Now, I was the first, I solved the first case in Colorado using DNA in 1991, which is very unusual. Uh, but it was because we had lots of sample. We had lots of blood from the bad guy, which you needed then when DNA first started. You needed like a microliter of liquid before you could even do a test. Now you can get cell DNA, you can get anything, it works. So, yeah, there are always advances in forensics that do make a difference. Now, of those uh, 31 that I had, I felt I knew who did 20 of them. The other 11, somebody on Earth at the time. Joe, you've, you've talked extensively through Homicide Hunter. You've uh, written now two books um, about your career and your case out of, out of all of that. What what case would you consider your defining moment? What stands out the most to you? Um, whether it be because you couldn't, um, you know, you, you couldn't get there where you, you where you wanted it to be, or or because it was just the most epic um, in your mind. You know, I, I never really thought about that. Every one of them was important to me. Every one, both solved and unsolved. There's no one that I'm outstanding over another. I wanted to solve all of those 31, not 28, but I still wanted to solve them all. I still think about them all the time. I still dream about them. I still look at them. What mistake did I make? What did I not do? What did I overlook? It never stops. Right. As far as the solved cases, when you begin a murder case, the perpetrator is a shadow in the night. You have no idea. Man, woman, kid, adult. Who is this? There is no better moment when the shadow has a first, middle, and last name and a date of birth. There's just no better moment than that. And that happened every single time out of 356. It's a wonderful feeling. So it all depends on how you look at it. I'm a smart guy who solved 92% of his cases. Or I'm a dumb guy who doesn't know who killed the percent of the people. It all depends on how you look at it. I had 217 trials for first degree murder. I had 215 and two. If I was a football team, I'd be a dynasty. <laughs> Absolutely. People are murdered. <laughs> and all the best I look at. That'd be a really odd uh, ring, I think, that they right. would give you for that. So <laughs> that's amazing. So I've always been intrigued by serial killers just because of the inner, like, what is going on in this crazy head? Um, uh -huh. I don't really want to know, but um, no, you don't. Do you, <laughs> do you feel that any of your investigations? There's one I'm thinking of in particular. Um, the one, the I think Kenny that killed Mickey at Mickey Dillman's crime Mickey. scene. You, pardon me, James Leonard Spencer, the guy who killed Mickey Dillman. Yes, you knew at that crime scene when you went in that it was different. You just felt oh, it, that it was more. And it's like, how, how do you know that? You just know it. I can't explain that to you, but 
it's it's just it's violent and it's quick and it's in and out that tells you surveillance he knows the killer knows this woman lives alone knows nobody else is going to be in there knows she doesn't have a pet no dog no anything that's going to protect her surveillance means a plan a plan means somebody that thinks now, he killed two women in the same complex before recounting. He'd have killed a hundred. I only encountered one other like that who had committed, well, he had missed the 15 homicide, but he said he really did 23, but it was a game for him that we didn't know about the other eight. He's on death row in Colorado for one of my cases. All the other murders he committed elsewhere. The only two I ever encountered were actually serial killers. They're very rare. Thank God. That's why most everybody knows their names, because they are so rare. Uh, John Wayne Gacy, who killed 33 boys in Illinois, there's a famous photograph of John Wayne Gacy in a tuxedo shaking hands with Gerald Ford in the White House, who was also wearing a tuxedo, because Gacy was the president, the national president, of the United States Chamber of Commerce. The time that photograph was taken, he had already murdered 17 children. One never knows who one's dealing with. But what happens with these guys, it always happens. Their appetite increases, they become careless, and they get arrested. Because of their careless behavior, that begins very cleverly and ends very badly. But many people die in the meantime. They're a true sociopath, incapable of human emotion. The only emotion they feel is rage. They're not capable of love or guilt or envy or sympathy or empathy or anything. They don't even understand the concept of those things. Don't make me mad. If you make me mad, I will kill you. And I won't remember doing it five minutes later. And those people, fortunately for all of us, are extremely rare. Edmund Kemper, who was a um, multiple homicide suspect in California on death row in San Quentin, was interviewed by the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. Kemper was six foot eleven, weighed three hundred and some pounds, huge guy, very intelligent, and completely insane. He would behead his victims and take the heads back to his apartment in a bowling bag so he could admire them before he got rid of them. Wow. During that interview, which I watched the video, I didn't interview him, mm-hmm. watched the video, FBI video. Kemper says to this agent, on this one occasion, he's coming down the stairs to dispose of a head that he has in his bowling bag because he's admired it for a few days. And coming up the stairs, he said, as a young couple, they were obviously in love and exchanging loving glances and holding hands. And he says, there I was on the staircase with this evidence of incredible violence in my hand. (laughs) He leaned across the table close to the agent and he said, a lesser man than I would have been driven insane by that. Edmund, you are insane. <laughs> but those kinds of people are really the world doesn't have many of them, thank God. Do you think that um, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was kind of the heyday of the serial killers? Do you think nowadays with all of the technology, the DNA and databases and everything, do you think that a serial killer could get away with the same stuff they did? Of course, years ago. of course they could. Because remember, you're not dealing with somebody who feels any guilt. He doesn't mean anything to him. If nobody hears him, then nobody sees him. <clears throat> and he cleverly disposes of the remains. People go missing all the time. Of those that are missing, how many are dead? I don't know. Neither is anybody else. 
Neither does anybody else. How many missing people are there every month in every city in America? How many of those have been picked up and grabbed by somebody? Some of them have. So, yeah, it's very difficult to say. The technology today would not stop someone like that. What stops them are themselves when they become careless. Um, I'm trying to think of another one of us that did that with, but it always happens with these guys. They just get so crazy that they get out of control. And then people do see them and they get arrested. Not that, um, not that I'm trying, but what would be the perfect way to not get careless as a serial killer? <laughs> Hi, Ted. <laughs> Hi, Ted. What, Ted? Perfect murders. I, I have a <laughs> the, 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 the first three are pretty pricey. So we I want to get. <laughs> That's that's the next book, right? It's yeah. a how-to. Well, so you're you're on your second book. Uh, your first book was I Will Find You. And mm -hmm. your second book, Killer Triggers, comes out on uh, March 9th. It does. Um, super excited about that. Tell us where, first of all, uh, our listeners can find it. We're going to put links to um, to it. But tell us where all we can find your book. Well, it's actually everywhere. Uh, it'll be anywhere books are sold. I okay. also read the audio book, so it's my voice on awesome. the audio, but by me, as I did with the first book. You can pre-order it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Audible.com, you name a place, it's there. Excellent. So it's not difficult to find. It's uh, It'll be available in e-book, uh, Kindle book, audio hardback every possible way perfect we, we've got a ton our, our listeners are readers they are we've had some authors on um and i mean they all go out and buy the books so mm -hmm. i know that they will this one because it, it's good um guys go get it well um, I, oh sorry go ahead but i appreciate you saying that awesome um tell us a little bit about your writing process. Did it change from your first book to your second book? Do you feel like you grew as an author? Was it hard to transition? I think the second book was a little easier to write. The first book, I wrote it six times and threw it away. And then I wrote it the seventh time. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. This time I only had to write it five times and throw it away. I'm getting a little better. Excellent. <laughs> Repetition. You know. Only three times next book, right? Well, I don't know. We'll see. I don't <laughs> Do you see it's, yourself writing another? It can, be, it can be maddening. I mean, there are days, that you, it's funny, but you write something, you think, boy, that sounds great. Then the next day you read it and say, who wrote this crap? Oh, that's right. Ugh. Well, we don't want that. It's gone. You know, let's start over. That's what you do. I usually do that after a couple of glasses of wine. The, the no. next day it doesn't make quite enough. You're Harder somehow when you've had a couple of glasses. <laughs> <laughs> do you see yourself writing more or do you have more in in the works that you're thinking about? There is, yeah, a couple of ideas. We'll see. We'll see. It's a matter of getting past the, this one now, you know, get this marketed and see what people think of it. And I said when I wrote the first book, I, my publisher said, well, well, now we're going to do this and we're going to do that. I said, no, 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 no. Now we give it to the jury. And they will decide. And now we're going to give this one to the jury on March the 9th. And now, they will decide. As an early juror, I can say it's excellent. And <laughs> we're very excited, very honored to be able to read it and then have you on. Like, it's so cool. I've watched you for years and I'm going to watch you for more years. So, how oh, cool good. is this? Very awesome. Yeah, the book, you definitely, once you started reading it, I, I couldn't put it down. So I spent my weekend reading you. So it was awesome. Well, that's kind of the idea. I mean, I tried, I tried to write this one from a conversational perspective, as if I'm sitting on your sofa telling you a story. Mm -hmm. More than I did in the first book. And now you are. It's like you're in my living room. Yes. Actually, Literally. My living room. 
<laughs> so to all of you who just get to read it, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> um, I heard um, that you can make a pretty mean Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You don't, you don't drink them, but you're a good. Man. Oh no. Why would I do that? I mean, <laughs> Um, so I want to talk to you about something that's, um, I think it's very near and dear to your heart and it is to mine as well. Um, the PTSD for, um, you know, for police officers, you know, my husband retired, um, a few years early. It was a tough decision. Um, he didn't go his full 25 years at the department, but, uh, we decided for the health of everyone that he needed to retire early. Um, and it was tough when he came out of retirement. It was, or went into retirement, it was tough. We had a few tough months and getting through. Um, and I would say he had PTSD from everything. He had some shootings. Um, he was involved in Vice and SWAT and got to be part of all of that, <laughs> um, right. as your wife did, as Kathy did, all of it. Um, and I think that a lot of, you know, the cops being on the outside looking in now. I don't think they realize that, that they have this and, you know, they're doing things to placate themselves. Um, I don't think you have time when you're an active duty law enforcement to deal with what you see and do. You are from one event to the next event. There's no time to consider what just happened, what you just saw, what you just did. Because that radio is squawking and you got to go somewhere else to do the same thing. So there is no time to consider the emotions. It builds up in you over time. And it can become overwhelming. When I retired, I felt like someone lifted an aircraft carrier off my head. I didn't walk out of the room. I floated My wife and I met in high school. We've been together forever. Uh, we've been married for 53 years. My son's retired from the Navy, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm an old guy. She and I have grown old together. And she always would be my guide. She would say to me, you need some help. You are full of venom. And she was right. And it took a couple of years. We worked on it together. Will it ever go away? No. Can you lessen it? Yes. Can you deal with it? Yes, you can. It isn't easy. No one ever said it's going to be easy. But you can deal with it. You can learn. For me, and it's very individualized, but for me, talking about it helps. Having a TV show is the most therapeutic thing I've ever done until I wrote a book. And that was even better. And now a second book, and even better again because you now have the time to reflect on what those emotions were and to rid some of your pain by opening up about it and not concealing it and not burying it and not ignoring it and not thinking it's gonna go away because it's not. Be honest with yourself. Stop this from happening to you. Stop this from poisoning you. Stop this from making you different. One of the nicest things that Kathy ever said to me, I'd been retired for two years. And I was sitting at the kitchen table, drinking a cup of coffee. And she said, hi. And I looked at her and I said, in case you haven't noticed, I've been sitting here for two hours. <laughs> I know but you're the Joe I married again. Ooh. <laughs> that was very nice. Yeah. 
Hmm. It took that long for me to get rid of the feelings. My wife and I went to the mall once. Not that long after. And this woman walks up to me. Says, I saw your show. I love your show. And I looked at her and I said, take your hand out of your purse. <laughs> she looked at me, what? I said, take your hand out of your purse. And she turned white. Hey, and Kathy grabs Joe. She's just a fan. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Of course, I had cerebral palsy or looked like she did. But it was like, you've got to get over this. You've got to stop being a cop. Not easy to do. It's instinct. It's instinct. But you've got to get through that. You've got to remember who you were before you raised your hand and who you are now. So if I ever see you in person, there's no running up and hugging you aggressively. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You couldn't do it then, but you could do it now. <laughs> it's been a remarkable experience to me. No one was ever happy to see me. <laughs> and now it's going to start. You really, you want my, what do you want my autograph? You know? <laughs> it's kind of bizarre, but it's, uh, it's, hey, I'm always nice to everybody. Full circle. I, I hold the dog and I hold the baby and I, I talk to everybody and I post her pictures and I'm all, because you should be. There's no percentage of being nice. And one other thing I'm always careful about, when you when I sign my name, you can read it. It's not a line and a dot. I sign my name. Awesome. And uh, people appreciate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I have enjoyed this thoroughly, and uh, thank you so much for allowing us to do this. And um, hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, we can have a cup of joe sometime together. There you go. <laughs> the official one from the right. official site <laughs> and not the knockoff site that I went to to get this one. You'll be very pleased at the quality and uh, their merchandise is quite good. They yeah, really good. This one's a little rashy, I think. I think I'm already <laughs> a little. Uh, uh, yes, well, what can you expect? You, know, if, I, um, you buy it from, from Discovery and you'll be much better off and very pleased with the result. Kathy has a lot of shirts as kind of a joke with us because she'll say, I'm going to wear this. I don't know. No, that's a knockoff. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I'll get one of the <laughs> So they don't get mad. You know, they're wearing somebody else's parts. Now we know. I love how you, I love how you talk about your wife and that just makes my heart very happy that you know, she must be one heck of a woman to put up with you all these years. And everything you've put her through. <laughs> whole life has been bent. She's got an Irish temper like a chainsaw. <laughs> how many I, times has she kicked you in the shim? I'm working on it. I don't understand it, but I'm working on it. Right. <laughs> the one thing you have to avoid with her is the narrow blue eyes. Oh, no, we don't want the narrow blue eyes. That's not good. That's right. Amazing. Well, I think uh, we're going to take another commercial break really quickly. And uh, we're actually going to turn over the show back to the guys that, uh, that know how to run things better than we. We just guessed at this. <laughs> but it has been amazing having you on. Well, thank you very much. A lot awesome. of fun. Thank you. Working Dog Radio, we love our sponsors. This episode is sponsored in part by Ray Allen at rayallen.com. Everything for dogs. Check out their uh, 10% discount code using working dog radio, all caps, rayallen.com for everything dogs. Be sure to check out Dogtra also. Eric and I love Dogtra. It's what we both use at the kennel each day. I like the 1900S. Be sure to check them out at dogtra.com. Use the discount code WDR10 for 10% off any single item over 200 bucks. Are you going to the Hits Canine this year, guys? The biggest and best conference in the United States, July 6th through the 9th, Scottsdale, Arizona. Hitscanine.net. Give uh, Jeff Baird a call, 863-529-5113. Making sure you have the right dog food is a super important part of running a working dog, whether it be police dogs, military dogs, or hunting dogs, or search and rescue. 
We like Kinetic Dog Food. The guys at Kinetic can be found at kineticdogfood.com. Area code 513-615-6904. Hit them up. We got a brand new sponsor, our good buddy, Jim O'Brien, down at NCK9 in North Carolina. Full service kennel, police dogs, single purpose, dual purpose, handler schools, trainer schools. Check them out, nck9.us. All right, we are back uh, with uh, Lieutenant Joe Kenda, TV personality, retired detective, author, uh, TV shows, um, Homicide Hunter, American Detective that's streaming on... um, Discovery Plus, I believe, these days. Uh, mm-hmm. Got a new book out, Killer Triggers. Now that our ladies know how to kill us and get away with it, um, and we couldn't hear any of that because we didn't have headphones on. So, exactly. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I could only hear her side of the story, and I kept hearing, so how do you not get caught? And I was like, what? I see a lot of oh. hand wringing. Like, mm-hmm. I was like, caught doing what? <laughs> what are you talking? What are you asking him about? <laughs> I was like, You're okay. Yeah. You don't have to work best home. You know, it's a, <laughs> right. I didn't. So I, I have one last question before we get into um, uh, some things is um, so m- management in a law enforcement agency management, um, usually from the lieutenant's status up is like, in my opinion, a lost art form. I think administrative stuff can actually sour a lot of guys on, on police work. And I'm wondering, how did you balance running such a successful major crimes unit and being involved in the investigation with the it being a manager and administrator and dealing with that day-to-day crap well of course you have to do that too but my advantage was we were successful so nobody above me wanted hmm. to the captains and deputy chiefs and chiefs of police i went through five chiefs of police in my career I had the numbers. So they said, we don't want to know what he does because whatever he does, is it's working. So they pretty much left me alone. And I used to tease my troops. I'd say, hey, we if it was legal, we could start our own police department and put this one out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Call us and we'll show up. You know? That's right. So it was kind of a joke. And the only time the management would ever speak to me is when overtime budget, I'd go through $6 million in overtime money by April 1st. Oh. Overtime, right? Hmm. And as they call me in and just go have a heart attack and say, you're out of money, you can't have any more overtime. So I'll tell you what, you select a victim that you consider to be completely unworthy. And we just want to investigate that, all right? Then watch the news tonight because it'll be on there talking about you. And of course, the money would somehow appear from somewhere and we would carry on. Shocking. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there, yeah, that's 100% true. The news is not going to go talk to you. They're going to go talk to <laughs> that's right. whoever has all the stripes on their sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> And those dudes right. love answering those kinds of questions. I promise that. <laughs> <laughs> so when's the book come out officially? March the 9th. March 9th. March 9th. Yeah, How, uh, everywhere? Like uh, Kindle? Or Every- like you can get it, all that? Uh, Books a Million, uh, Barnes & Noble, Audible.com. There's the audio version, which I read. I read the audio myself. I didn't have an actor do it. And every place where books are sold, every place, they mark to everyone. So it's oh, yeah. available. Amazon has it right now for pre-order. You know, so. Well, this is going to go out on March 3rd. 3rd. Yeah, March 3rd. So six days prior, so six days after you hear this, you can get it on all, yeah. those, all those places. So, or you can pre-order it. Yeah. Now yeah. I asked Alicia, I was like, did, uh, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. I'm glad you answered that. I said, I'm sure it's going to be on Audible. And I said, I can't imagine Joe letting somebody else read it. <laughs> or needing. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so Excellent. You can hear it from him. From, from oh, him. Yeah. And it's funny. It's weird, you know, cop 
famous cop stuff is strange, right? It's a, it's a weird yeah. thing, but you made a dude famous, the guy who played you in the homicide hunter. Like that guy, that guy is baby Joe Kendo. Not, not as thick hair from what I've seen from the old day pictures, <laughs> but. Uh... Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, pretty happy to have that part. He was uh, starring in a show that was very successful. It was all over the world for nine years. I mean, that's a big deal for an actor. It's a nice continued paycheck. So, <laughs> oh yes, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, social media wise, where does the book have its own thing, or do you have like an Instagram and a Facebook uh, for like Joe Kenda? Uh, the The network maintains Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for me. Okay. Uh, and Blackstone, the publisher, also has social media platforms for all of their books. So you can find this any number of ways and any number of places. That's a mic drop thing right there. That's a, that was a big flex. <laughs> yeah, they, I got it. They do that. Yeah. All. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. do any of that shit. <laughs> you can find it. <laughs> Just search it on Instagram and Facebook and you'll find He's it. He's like this. He, he went, you know, all right. I yeah. got it. You'll be all right. <laughs> How about you, Ted? Where are you at? Uh, Instagram, Ted underscore Summers uh facebook um we're at torchlight canine and then hrd police canine um hrd and then working dog radio obviously and then the instagram for the podcast is working underscore dog underscore radio uh and then hrd police canine letter k number nine torchlight canine letter k number nine um i'm constantly floored that there's so many people that follow the podcast but don't follow me and you because i mean you know i post like personal stuff well i mean my personal account is basically a work account anyway and uh, it's all stuff that I'm doing day to day with whatever I've got going on at the kennel. Same thing with you. You've got the pet thing. Uh, yeah, I got uh, Van S. Canine on Instagram. I got Van S. Canine Academy right. on Facebook. Uh, Working Dog Radio. We got T-shirts on there. We, our stuff's pretty cool, man. We got good stuff on there. And while we're recording this, we're starting a dog tree giveaway. With dog is one of our big sponsors. Oh, that's right. A giveaway a week. Are we gonna do or a month? I think a week, right? Uh, I think it's a week. Yeah, yeah. We, we had some internal discussions today. So we have a pile pile, <laughs> pile of stuff in my living room right now. Like I came home and I was like, where the hell is all this? And, you know, they're like, oh, doctor sent it to us to give away. So we have like $6,000 of this shit in my living room to give away <laughs> to listeners. So uh, everybody loves free stuff and doctor makes great stuff so um we're gonna find some inventive ways to give that stuff away so uh we there's gonna be some following on youtube uh following on instagram following on facebook and then for our patreon members too so we'll kind of spread the love out we got to figure out how we're gonna do all that but yeah so if you're listening to this it's gonna be on the third we're like starting like right after march 1st so basically monday of next week so yeah 